ahora sí. ¿No? Hola, o mi voz. Hablo más fuerte. ¿Ahora sí me oyen? Ah, ok. Estaba hablando muy lejos. Bueno, buenas tardes. Muchas gracias por haber venido a esta nueva conferencia en el panorama actual de Ciencias de la Atmósfera del Centro de Ciencias de la Atmósfera. Eh, ahora tendremos a Marat Kairotinov, quien es profesor de la Universidad de Stony Brook, donde yo estudié y Marat coincide que es mi, fue mi asesor de doctorado. Iba a dar la presentación en inglés para que no pensara que decía cosas malas de él a sus espaldas, pero dice que no hay problema y le parece más interesante, entonces me quedaré con la, la tradición de presentarlos en español, como se hace usualmente. Bueno, como ya les dije, Marat es profesor ahí de, de la Universidad de Stony Brook, él también es miembro fundador de la facultad de la misma universidad, del Instituto de... De, de ciencias computacionales avanzadas y les voy a dar un poco de perfil sobre Marat para, para que tengan el contexto. Él estudió, eh, tuvo estudios de, de licenciatura en física y luego posgrado en la misma área en el Instituto de Física y Tecnología de Moscú. Eh, después fue a Estados Unidos y estudió en la Universidad de de Oklahoma, eh, ahí, ahí realizó su estudio de doctorado y uno de sus principales resultados fue el desarrollo de uno, de uno de los primeros modelos, eh, Large Eddy Simulation, con aplicaciones a la atmósfera. Las primeras aplicaciones están orientadas a, a estudiar procesos en la capa límite principalmente y tenía resolvía procesos microfísicos explícitamente. Eh, después Marat eh, pasó a ser científico en la Universidad eh, Estatal de Colorado, Fort Collins, con eh, David Randall. Eh, ahí eh, hizo el modelo más robusto, lo, lo hizo unas adecuaciones para que contemplara también procesos convectivos profundos. Y después ese mismo modelo que fue muy, era muy eficiente para resolver procesos eh, de convección profunda, fue usado, eh, implementado por Marat para realizar la primera superparametrización, donde la parametrización de modelos cumulus se realiza explícitamente por un modelo de resolución de nubes. Entonces, al final del día Marat ha, ha trabajado con parametrizaciones microfísicas, desarrollo de modelo y luego la implementación de ese modelo en modelos globales, ese modelo con resolución de nubes. Entonces, es muy diversa su, su, su experiencia, él tiene expertise en turbulencia, microfísica, procesos convectivos profundos, pero el eje que guía su, su investigación es principalmente el desarrollo de... Eh, modelos numéricos. Y ahora nos va a hablar sobre eh, self-organization of convection and regulation of the tropical climate. Entonces, eh, no va en, eh, por lo que tengo entendido, eh, va, va a presentar algunos resultados de una manera muy visual, más que nada cualitativa por, por los estudiantes, que es uno de los principales motiva, motivos por los cuales realizamos este este panorama, esperemos que no esté muy, muy clavado, pero bueno, ya veremos. Ahora qué bueno que doy la presentación en español. <laughs> y entonces, bueno, eh, muchas uh, thank you very much, Professor Marat. Now it's your turn. Should I? Oh. Uh, thank you very much, Diego. Uh, uh, funny, I understood almost everything you said. Um, it's actually, uh, terminology is very similar in both languages, so I understood what you were talking about. Okay, so um, it's uh, very nice to be here. Uh, uh, thanks, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, it's my first uh, time in Mexico City. I, it's actually, I imagine that um, that it was, it's going to be very hot, and here it's actually, <laughs> again, it's stereotype, like, you know, everybody uh, has uh, about Mexico that it's very hot and humid, but uh, Actually, it's completely opposite. It's much nicer climate than in New York, that's for sure. Um, because in New York, it's now very humid and hot. And uh, so here is just amazing weather. 
Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, this topic that I have been um, uh, kind of pounding recently uh, with my colleague, uh, Kerry Emanuel from MIT. Um, we've, we've been doing this for maybe eight years now with various degree of success. And we call it like it's self-organization or self-aggregation. We call it self-aggravation. <laughs> so because uh, it's really a very difficult topic. Um, so uh, just to give you kind of this uh, background, you of course uh, probably many of you have seen this figure before or similar figures. That uh, I like to show to my students in my undergraduate uh, atmospheric physics class. Uh, basically, that encompasses all, uh, all the, our knowledge about climate system in a very simple uh, way. And uh, this is just fluxes of uh, energy in, uh, uh, in the Earth's climate system. And you see that many um, processes, like reflection of sunlight, uh, greenhouse effect, and of course hydrological cycle, all these processes involve clouds. So clouds are extremely important and for, for understanding how climate system works. And uh, uh, it's very important also to understand how clouds would react to projected uh, climate change. I don't like the term climate uh, global warming because that's kind of became, uh, you know, a certain political, uh, uh, um, political accent to it. I think we should say climate change, then uh, people would agree with you more. Okay, so um, uh, one of the things that motivated this kind of study uh, is this uh, notion uh, or this um, uh, knowledge that we have from paleoclimate studies, although it's a little bit controversial and uh, the way how you collect this kind of evidence can be criticized and it's still not settled science, it's difficult. Uh, but from these very old paleoclimate uh, reconstructions of temperature um, in the long past, say uh, 50 million years ago, 55 million years ago, when the uh, amount of CO2 was very high, uh, extremely high compared to today, um, it was not twice or three times high, it was uh, from six to eight times higher than today. And during those times, of course, planet was very warm, but surprisingly from paleoclimate uh, reconstructions, um, the tropics have not been such so warm as you would expect from simple just increasing CO2. They've been uh, basically about the same temperature as today maybe slightly warmer, but not much. While extratropics, uh, uh, polar regions were extremely warm to the point that crocodiles fossils are still found in Alaska, for example. So, uh, and uh, palm trees uh, prints on, on, a, on coal, for example, you can find in, in a tundra region, the tundra today. So it was very warm climate, but tropics were not that uh, responsive to CO2 forcing. So it was kind of interesting what kind of powerful negative feedback could be working, if of course it's true, because again, this reconstruction um, uh, is not settled yet. Um, but still, there are many other things, uh, many, other, uh, many other sources of evidence that tropics were not that warm. I mean, well, they were warm, but not that warm that you'd expect from, say, six times CO2. Um, oops. So uh, the, the, um, I use more, of course, we, we can use only models to test some of those ideas. We cannot increase CO2 uh, to this level uh, for science experiment in, on the planetary scale. So the only way we can test those ideas uh, is using models. And I use um, uh, this approach, which, I called, uh, which is called radiative convective equilibrium. Um, which is very commonly used in cloud resolving modeling community. It's basically it's climate model analog for cloud resolving models. And in, in this uh, framework, you basically run your model freely. You don't specify anything except for you maybe you prescribe sea surface temperature and maybe uh, uh, amount of CO2, for example, in the atmosphere. But everything else is kind of uh, a bubbling convection. Uh, and it's very good approximation for tropics because tropics export only about 20% of energy to extratropics. 
And this 80% energy is basically just an exchange of our short wave and long wave radiation, uh, tropics as a whole. So the tropics as a whole can be considered this kind of uh, um, state of atmosphere in radiative convective equilibrium, unlike, say, uh, mid-latitudes where transport is very important. Um, so you uh, compute everything, microphysics, transport uh, by convection, vertical transport. You can add planetary rotation, for example, like Coriolis force, and uh, simulate, say, tropical cyclones. Um, uh, you compute radiation. So everything is uh, in domain of doubly periodic, so basically like real Earth, it's periodic, so any, there are no lateral boundaries, and there are only top and, and bottom boundaries. And you run this model for a long time, and then you compute some statistics uh, from that, and responses. So the models that I use is my model, which is called System for Atmospheric Modeling. I developed that model while I was a student, uh, graduate student, and it has, of course, evolved since that time. Uh, it's uh, an elastic model, so there are no sound waves. It can be two-dimensional, three-dimensional. Um, it uh, has all these uh, different microphysical packages. Um, and uh, it's uh, massively parallel, so it can be run on uh, very big computers uh, using uh, many processors. And currently, um, it's pretty popular in the US among uh, uh, cloud resolving uh, modelers. Um, at least I know that uh, currently there are about maybe 20, 30 active users of that model and uh, more than uh, 100 people downloaded it at various times. You can download it uh, too, uh, just sending me an email and um, uh, you can get one. So uh, um, this is how typical radiative convective equilibrium simulation looks like. So you have this bubbling convection. Uh, this is domain uh, of size 512 kilometers and the resolution grid spacing is one kilometer. And you see that it's uh, convection just happily bubbling and nothing really particularly interesting is going on. So now if you increase domain size, something um, um, or reduce resolution, which is kind of uh, weird, um, make it more viscous flow, you uh, kind of get this kind of interesting result that instead of this happily bubbling, convection aggregates into this one spot surrounded by a very dry region. Um, it's called, uh, this phenomenon is called self-aggregation. Um, and um, uh, there, there have been quite a few papers currently written on, on uh, explaining this phenomenon. And um, what, what is interesting about it is that if you compare this disaggregated state or this happily bubbling state, uh, say you take uh, initial uh, five days or so of simulation when it's not aggregated yet and compare it to aggregated state. Uh, and you look, say, or at outgoing long wave radiation fields like shown here. So if you look at mean, you see that in disaggregated state or this bubbling state, uh, there is much less long wave radiation leaving the, air, the area to space. Uh, then in aggregated states, so aggregated states basically open the skies and all this Surface, uh, uh, surface temperature, or in this case, sea surface temperature, uh, has a chance to cool because of that. So there is this negative feedback, positive uh, due to aggregation. So aggregated state makes atmosphere drier, reduces greenhouse effect. As a result, you increase outgoing long wave radiation because uh, water vapor is main green, uh, major greenhouse uh, gas. So that's what aggregation does. Another uh, piece of puzzle that we get, uh, accidentally, uh, when I tried to change uh, sea surface temperature in wide range, and then I accidentally found that this phenomenon of aggregation into this, uh, this blob of convection happens only at certain temperature and above. So there is a threshold between, uh, uh, for sea surface temperature between a state of when convection aggregates and a state when it doesn't. Uh, you can see this kind of two uh, set of plots for different temperatures. And in this case, particular case, aggregation happens about uh, 297 degrees, which is basically current uh, average temperature of, uh, of, of tropical sea surface temperature. 
So, um, and again, if you compare uh, these aggregated states, which are uh, blue here, here blue states are uh, disaggregated, so, uh, sorry, states, so cold uh, states, and warm states, and what is shown here is relative humidity, horizontal axis relative humidity, vertical is height. You can see that aggregated states uh, uh, have a s uh, smaller relative humidity, uh, so atmosphere is drier than disaggregated state. And now uh, there have been several observational studies of this phenomenon, uh, particularly the study by Tobin et al., who's shown on the right. Here it's the same plot, but found from observations uh, looking at some uh, soundings uh, from, uh, uh, from some uh, sensor that actually looks at vertical profiles of water vapor. And you see that for uh, they looked at certain uh, uh, areas, say 10 by 10 degrees in size, so about 1,000 by 1,000 kilometers. And when they saw many convective clusters in that uh, region, uh, they would call it dis uh, disaggregated state, so it's not aggregated state. When we, they saw one big or two big clusters, that's aggregated state. So they classified by that, and then they plotted relative humidity in those states. And they see the same thi thing, that when uh, convection is more aggregated on real Earth, it's actually uh, drier. Atmosphere becomes drier around uh, that convection. So uh, that actually confirmed observation in this behavior. So why, why convection actually aggregates uh, in a certain uh, temperature and doesn't in other temperature? Uh, there are a couple, at least, or two or three mechanisms proposed over the years. Um, the one that I kind of uh, like is uh, recently was published by uh, Kerry Manuel and, and all, et al. back in 2014 in James, I, I think. Um, so basically, uh, what, what is shown here is a running single column model, very simple one. Also in the uh, radiative convective equilibrium, single column model is basically climate model, models physical column, just one column, that not forced by any advection, just uh, basically again uh, allowed to run um, convective schema or so. So they produce this kind of equilibrium state, it's at different temperatures, and then uh, they uh, remember this aggregation creates these dry regions, very fast uh, areas. And if you look, actually, I didn't actually mention that. If you look at this, you see that first what it starts, this blue big thing, it's dry regions. They grow. It's not that uh, the uh, convection actually aggregates. It's basically pushed in the region by these dry regions around it, pushed it into region. So it starts from drying. And this drying seems to be an uh, unstable process. So there is some insta unstable process that enforces this dry region. So initially, you create some dry regions by chance, like say by uh, outflow from convection somewhere, this dry region. And then somehow, it becomes amplified. And this amplification is called radiative convective instability. And it was pioneered by Kerry Manuel explaining it. So basically, what you do here, so they did, uh, they have these profiles. And then what they did, they reduced uniformly water vapor by 20% everywhere at all heights. So basically just saying, OK, what, what is the response of radiation to that in one time step? So they reduce it by 20% and then compute radiative heating again. And this is what's shown. Uh, red uh, lines are a response of solar radiation. In this case, it's not particularly important. But more important is the response of long wave radiation, which is uh, blue lines. And the uh, uh, red ones is a control simulation. So now you see that for a left one is um, uh, for temperatures, 25 degrees Celsius, that's C surface temperature, so it's cold SST, and the right panel is for warm, very warm SST of 40 degrees Celsius. And you can see uh, right away that uh, uh, basically uh, um, uh, you see uh, that in uh, this stable case or this disaggregated state, you see that uh, net response of radiation is warming. So you, you reduce uh, uh, water vapor and you're warming. How it happens? Uh, well, when you have not uh, a relatively small amount of water vapor in the atmosphere, it's a greenhouse effect. 
but it's not saturated. The effect is not saturated. So if you reduce water vapor amount, you basically reduce emitters of long wave radiation, a uh, number of them. Uh, and then it's basically, it, it, it would cool less. It would provide less greenhouse effect. Less cooling means it's like warming. Less cooling is the same thing as warming relative to control. And that way, if you have this subsiding cool air, or dry air, in that case, it's actually warming. And in that case, it's positive and negative feedback. It will stop because it's becoming um, stable. So in this case, it doesn't really work. And uh, so that's why disaggregated state is, does not, uh, aggregation does not happen at cold temperatures. But when you have warm enough atmosphere, you have a lot of water vapor, and it, in low levels, it becomes saturated in respect to radiation. So you, if you dare even reduce slightly the amount of uh, water vapor, it doesn't affect low troposphere at all, because it's already saturated. But it affects str strongly, of course, upper uh, uh, troposphere. So this radiation emitted by low levels goes now through, through that troposphere, which does not have enough water vapor now to stop it. And that way, you actually cool low troposphere. And um, so the, 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 uh, the slide below shows the net effect for all temperatures, so that if you increase it from 25 degrees to 40, so you go from uh, here, when there is net warming effect, which is negative feedback, to cooling. So when you cool the subsiding air, you cool it, it's actually subsiding even more. So that's so at certain temperature, there is a switch from that regime to a different regime. So at certain sea surface temperature, there is, you develop this uh, convective instability. So that's basically the mechanism. So that uh, uh, allowed us uh, with Kerry to propose this kind of, sorry for a little bit, uh, not, not very, this mechanism is called, that we call self-organized criticality. So we believe that tropical climate, because of this effect, is like glass of water with ice. So you, um, you all know if you add some uh, uh, heat to that glass with uh, ice, nothing, temperature will not change, right? Some ice will melt and that's it. So, uh, and if you re remove some uh, heat from the glass, it also will, will not uh, change temperature. So you see that this is kind of a tra phase transition. So we believe that because of this effect with uh, atmosphere, with this ag aggregation, self-aggregation, a uh, tropical atmosphere can be in this state when in between these two states, disaggregated and aggregated, aggregated state, so basically liquid water and ice. And so basically you warm SSTs, let's say by putting more CO2, that will cause uh, uh, more aggregation because it's uh, warmer SST, more conducive to aggregation to uh, this effect. And that would dry the troposphere, as we saw. And tro dry troposphere actually would reduce greenhouse effect and try to cool SST back. Of course, and then that would cause less aggregation or disaggregation of convection, and that would remove the negative troposphere. So there is this negative feedback that keeps tropics at about constant temperature. Of course, it's very difficult to prove because for that we need to put really, like say, double, triple CO2 and see what happens. Uh, we cannot do it in, a, in a actual tropics, although we, we're doing it right now. So eventually we will know the result, maybe in, uh, I don't know, 20, 30 years. Um, so I, I, I cross my fingers, like I, I keep my fingers crossed to live to that time and to see if it was right. But of course, we, uh, we, we have models to test some of it. So in this case, we use this uh, 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 approach. We need really big domain for that. Uh, the thing is, uh, this mechanism, this radiative convective equilibrium, it can be shown mathematically that it works the best for big scales. It doesn't really work well for small scales. One of the reason is, reasons uh, is that um, that for small scale, you always have wind shear and other things that smear this initial moist, uh, dry thing. Uh, the, the simulation that I showed you before didn't have mean wind. That's why it kind of was easy to aggregate. But if you have actual atmosphere, you, you have this uh, winds everywhere, all these waves, disturbances, that kind of tend to smear all these initial dry patches. 
And that's why on small scales it shouldn't work. But it should work on very large scales, say on Kelvin wave scales, uh, and made in Julian oscillation scales, kind of uh, very large uh, 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 disturbances of very large scales. So the bigger the scale, the easier this mechanism works. So you need really a large domain to see anything. So uh, what, uh, what I try to do here um, is just to run the same convective radiative convective equilibrium simulation, but using a really large domain. In this case, it's um, a half of Earth's circumference, so it's 184 degrees equivalent in longitude, so it's uh, about half the Earth, and it's going to 46 degrees north and 46 degrees south, so it's about half um, of extent, and the reason I didn't go farther, because this model, this version had um, Cartesian grid, and it would be very awkward to go further, because, you know, in the actuality, it's getting small and small space in, on actual Earth. So this is kind of some compromise. And um, uh, what is, was specified here is uh, sea surface temperature. Yeah, oh, sorry. Oh. So that's just a visualization. And we specified sea surface temperature, which is kind of uh, similar to observed kind of mean sign-like profile. So it's warm in tropics and kind of cool off to, towards mid-latitudes. And so there is some berkelinicity, which you can see that you have extra tropical cyclones as well. And in the middle, you have this kind of uh, tropical ITCZ. Uh, with some, uh, you can see these big waves, Kelvin -like, look like Kelvin waves moving to the east, and uh, some smaller scale waves moving to the west, and so all sorts of kind of things going on here at once. Uh, of course, there is no MGO here because the uh, domain is too small for that. So, how you now look uh, at all this kind of, uh, it looks like a very busy picture. So um, uh, what we try to do here is to basically use the same methodology that was used by Tobin at all studies that I mentioned before, the satellite study that they showed that actually relative humidity indeed uh, is uh, reducing at, uh, uh, at aggregated con uh, when aggregate aggregated convection is present. So we use this, the methodology. So we take, I have many, uh, say, uh, over a period of several, more than a month, snapshots every three hours or so of these uh, three-dimensional cloud fields and other fields. Uh, so you have this cloud cover, let's say. And, but cloud cover is kind of not very easy to work with because small clouds, shallow clouds, deep clouds, they all look the same on a visible kind of image like that. So I'm interested in these deep clouds, and deep clouds, of course, you need to look at temperature of tops to say that they're deep. So uh, we use brightness temperature, the same as, as a study by Tobin et al. Brightness temperature, so it's basically infrared uh, uh, temperature. And now you can see where deep clouds are better. And now you uh, reduce it to, so you, you take this scene like that and you uh, average it to 50 kilometer boxes, uh, because satellite resolution was 50 kilometer in that study. So to be kind of consistent. And that way you actually make uh, clusters more visible because uh, you kind of, uh, that way they tend to be two kind of uh, continuous kind of uh, um, picture which is difficult to uh, see uh, individual clusters. So you have clusters like that, middle, middle uh, plot here. Uh, now uh, you count them. Uh, basically you write a very simple algorithm which is like 10 lines of code which is called uh, spill, spillover algorithm or something. It's a very simple algorithm. And then you fill all the diff clusters that are not intercorrected with different numbers. And then you count them. And at the same time, you count area of clusters. So it's very easy to do. So this is what is shown. Different colors just show different clusters. So now you see that uh, you have really various clusters of various sizes. And you do that for each scene that you have. In this case, it's like more than 300 cloud scenes like that, and you do it only for tropics, so for this tropical belt. So, and then you plot PDF. And then you do the same simulation, but you increase temperature by four Kelvin, sea surface temperature uniformly everywhere. Just make it like warmer world. 
Now you can see something. Okay, let's see. Uh, this left figure is a PDF, so number of clusters on the vertical axis, and, try, uh, and horizontal axis is uh, clusters area in uh, square pixels. So um, you see that distribution is, uh, uh, is power law, right? For most of the clusters, except for very big ones. Those so-called super clusters. Those that are really Kelvin waves and uh, Rossby gravity, uh, uh, equatorially trapped Rossby waves. So that's very, very, very big clusters. And you see that now, uh, now if you look at the warmer case, when you plus 4K, which is red, um, you see that, as I mentioned before, smaller clusters don't care about this instability. You see that smaller clusters, they're all the same, PDF looks exactly the same. But big clusters, now the number increases by a factor of 10. So indeed, at warmer climate, very big clusters, the, the, kind of, the number increased dramatically. So climate system is trying to produce more aggregated convection on large scales um, in this simulation. In terms of uh, uh, power law, it's, it, 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 does, it is indeed observed in nature. This uh, right figure is from observational study by Peters and all uh, that look, who look at satellite data and it's basically similar plot, PDF um, and area in square kilometers, not in, a, in this kind of logarithmic scale, it doesn't really matter. Which is, uh, so you see that it's indeed, uh, it's indeed a line, so it's power law, except for very big clusters. So very big clusters don't obey it, like, like in simulation. Um, so climate system may be indeed in this state on between clustered and unclustered convection. That's why this number of superclusters kept kind of low. Because if you increase the hydride right atmosphere, it's immediately kind of negative feedback that gets rid of them. But if you don't have this feedback by increasing by 4 Kelvin, I remove this feedback, right? I just increase everywhere temperature. They, the number of clusters dramatically, superclusters dramatically increases, which actually would, if I let SST evolve, and I, I haven't done that experiment yet, but I will do that, if you make it interactive CCS temperature, uh, it would cool it back. Um, that, but that remains to be seen, that remains to be done. So uh, now if you look at, uh, uh, at statistics, uh, and a similar statistics that Tobin and et al. Done, have done. So what we looked at these 10 by 10 degree areas of those uh, um, uh, cluster uh, regions, 10 by, the 10 by 10 degree regions, and we just count those clusters in that re in a particular region, say, if we have, uh, say, in this, uh, on the left it's like six, this one is less aggregated state, because you have many, and then when you have like uh, one in this case, that's aggregated state, that counts like aggregated state. So we basically, this is our metric. Of course, it's not perfect, but statistically, if you have many, many clusters like that, you can eventually say that if you have really few clusters, they tend to be aggregated. And if you have many, many clusters, that's disaggregated convection. So, um, now let's look uh, compared to observations. So left one is a model. Uh, horizontal axis is number of clusters. So the smaller the number, the more aggregated convection in that particular box. And vertical uh, axis is precipitable water or water integrated water vapor, so the amount of water vapor in the atmosphere. And the right is a similar kind of plot, but from observations. Uh, for, uh, for today's atmosphere. And you see that indeed, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, in observations you see this, that when the convection becomes more aggregated, it's significantly less water vapor in, uh, in that box. Uh, and the same thing uh, uh, can be seen in the model, the same response. Now if you look at uh, radiation, <coughs> so uh, left one is incoming uh, solar radiation. So you see this interesting phenomenon that aggregated convection has less incoming solar radiation, which is kind of 
nonsense, right? How incoming radiation depends on uh, how many clusters you have. And the thing is, it's just because it's more nocturnal in nature. So when you have super clusters or more cluster, clustering convection, it, it appears that it's actually a more night condition than day conditions. So that's why incoming radiation, and that actually has very strong effect because without this effect, there would be wash. So that basically uh, the effect of short wave and long wave radiation would, would cancel out uh, due to aggregation. And that would actually, in a, another study by, I think it also was Tobin uh, uh, at all, they actually shown that there is no effect of aggregated convection on net radiation absorbed by the uh, climate system. And the, the problem is, because they looked not at the absorbed, at the um, uh, absorbed, uh, at the absorbed solar radiation, they looked at reflected solar radiation, which is not the same thing. It's the same thing for climate model average over one day. But I if you average over, say, one hour, it depends if, if it's night or uh, if it's day. So basically, absorbed solar radiation is not the same as uh, reflected solar radiation just changing sign because your incoming solar radiation is also different. And so if you take that effect into account, then, oh, sorry. Yeah, this is net. The right is the net. That's what hits the climate system. So it's absorbed solar radiation minus outgoing solar radiation, uh, outgoing long wave radiation. So that's net. And you see that aggregated convection is about 150 watts per meter square is, uh, produces this outgoing net effect, cooling effect, then disaggregated convection. 150 watts. That's doubling CO2 is only 4 watts per meter square. This one is 150, so it's such a powerful effect. Uh, so that's why I think um, uh, so far we're kind of optimistic about, about our hypothesis, but we need, of course, more to show it in interactive framework, when you have actually feedback to sea surface temperature and see how the, the whole thing actually works. That's in near future, so, so stay tuned. And that's just uh, some intermediate, intermediate summary on this part. Uh, so, um, so distribution of area clusters is described by power law, which is itself is not really explained yet, why it should be the case. Uh, but uh, the response to f warming of, of, uh, of surface or climate system in this, this idealized climate system uh, is, uh, is really uh, only felt by, uh, only manifest itself only by superclusters, but not small and middle-sized clusters, because middle-sized clusters, they're not so responsive to this uh, radiative uh, convective instability mechanism, again, for the reasons because there is too much noise on those scales, I think. That's why they, they're not responding. Uh, while bigger clusters, they basically, uh, they have more time, so to speak, for radiation to work. And that's why they're more responsive. And uh, uh, so, uh, so the, the overall conclusion that so far these ideal simulations support our hypothesis that in warmer climate or increasing CO2 can lead to more aggregated tropical convection uh, in the form of superclusters that will, would have uh, powerful negative feedback. But it's only in tropics. In high latitudes, it's not the case, unfortunately. So we live not in quite in tropics. Uh, well, uh, in the interest of time, I skip this thing because that's really too technical, I think. It's just a similar thing, but about MGO. And I will um, um, show uh, some uh, uh, preliminary results um, that, uh, remember that I showed this picture. And main thing that, and we have been criticized for that too, that we put walls, because this domain is rectangular, <laughs> We put walls in the north and south. I haven't mentioned that, but you have to. Why not periodical? Because cyclones in northern hemisphere, if they get to the southern hemisphere, 
through periodical domains, they become anticyclones. And that's not good uh, for, for simulation. So th that would be really bizarre. So to avoid that, we just pull wall, put walls. Um, uh, but of course, it wouldn't be nice to go to the poles all the way, uh, or almost all the way, so take into account this, uh, uh, the, uh, the reduction in area with uh, latitude. So for that, you need to go to latitude-longitude grid. And when, if, if you do that, you build right away from existing model with relatively small effort, because you don't start from scratch, um, uh, you go to global cloud resolving model. So what I'm going to show next is some preliminary results on global cloud resolving model. So basically, it's just equations. You see those. <laughs> I don't want you to see them. It's just governing equations, but those that underscored by red, those terms you need to add to latitude longitude uh, grid. That's all. So just very few modified terms, and you're done. And also because there is pole problem. In latitude, longitude grid, you all know, uh, velocities are not defined at the pole. And there are other things, like delta x goes to zero and delta y goes to zero there. Um, and uh, certain terms become infinity. So singularity point. So there are ways to avoid that, but they involved pretty elaborate methods. and significant change of the code structure because of message passing in, on parallel computers, how it works. To avoid that, I just put a big building on the pole. Why well, put a skyscraper there? You think that like one of those Dubai kind of type, <laughs> no? <laughs> like whole troposphere, even higher than Dubai, and a little bit wider than Dubai, say one degree uh, in the radius. So it's about 100. Uh, 100 kilometer kind of radius building. Um, that seems to be kind of big, but actually, if you think about how big the Earth is, you think that putting building on the, on the pole would do much harm to, say, tropical simulations that I'm mostly interested, probably not. So for now, it's a kind of temporary fix. I'm not insisting that this is, everybody should do that. But that's allowed it to do it fast. So uh, this model, um, um, uses uh, 16 uh, land types, which I was fortunate enough, I just, uh, my, another student graduated right, right before this exercise, and she actually built a so-called sim uh, simple land surface model, simplified land model, and so it was already available to me. I uh, added just different land types, a little bit, uh, some coefficients here and there, but it was easy to do. And uh, uh, it has uh, realistic topography uh, with four kilometer grid spacing. So, uh, and topography is implemented so that I wouldn't change the code because remember I have Cartesian grid. I just put uh, so-called block topography. You see these certain cells are just filled with stuff that causing velocity to be zero there. That's basically what topography is like. Air just cannot go through it. Um, and it works surprisingly well. It's called uh, it, uh, immersed boundary method or variant of it. So this is simulation, a four kilometer simulation of about 40 days. Um, uh, the resolution of this simulation is actually such that one pixel, I believe it's like high definition here, is about what? It's about uh, eight grid points in one pixel of this, of this image. So you, you, you don't see actual, actual resolution here. It's impossible. Um, and it runs relatively fast. Um, it, takes, it takes about, uh, it's, it runs, runs six times faster real time, which is still kind of relatively slow, but it's four kilometer grid spacing. Um, so uh, this simulation, 40 days, uh, takes about uh, almost one million core hours on supercomputer. Um, so it's really a little bit expensive to run. Yeah. You need to have large account. <laughs> and, um, so it cannot be done on Linux cluster. So um, uh, just uh, another thing, just another view of the same simulation, just looking at, at the Earth, and I a little bit turned it to show this building there. You see the place where building is. 
And if you look at carefully, uh, well, especially in the bottom, do you really see anything artificial? Uh, I don't know. Maybe, but who cares, right? It's Antarctica. <laughs> <laughs> For northern latitude, of course, it's important. Uh, some waves can be. But even here, you see this wave coming around. I don't know. Um, but it's very nice fix because putting this pole point, it could be done, but it would change the code dramatically and would take considerable time to implement. So this is just some uh, 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 comparison to reanalysis over this simulation, uh, um, like the top is model, bottom is uh, European Central reanalysis for the same period. This one is monthly precipitation, so it's total accumulated precipitation for um, or mean actually divided by 40 days or so. So you see that uh, general structure very well captured. You see, of course, it cannot be one-to-one. -one. It's not weather forecasting problem. This one is basically free run. But I'm glad that uh, this is basically one of the first runs, and without really much of a debugging or tuning, um, I was able to uh, capture main features of general circulation in this respect. This one is a uh, water vapor, column water vapor. You can see that uh, it's also well captured of this position of fronts, of dry fronts, and so on. And this one is, I looked at uh, uh, probability or dynamic cycle of precipitation. The horizontal axis is 24 hours. Uh, <coughs> vertical is precipitation rate above one millimeter per day. So you see that it for various regions, say for, for example, for Amazonia, uh, you see that it's about like maybe three o'clock maximum, two or three o'clock, which is observed. So overall, even four kilometer grid, even, even, even though it's relatively coarse, it's still coarse. Of course, for to resolve nice convection, you need probably one kilometer grid. But still, even with such relatively coarse resolution, you're, you're able to reproduce the annual cycle of precipitation. So it's dated tsunami at three billion grid points, blah, 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 how to save for this and write. That's the main challenge, of course. It's, uh, now, of, of course, this model is very, uh, very expensive to run. So it, you need very good application for it. One application that I mentioned before is kind of cluster analysis. That's uh, I haven't done it yet, but another one is forecasting, weather forecasting, right? So, so you have this uh, thing, why not forecast some tropical cyclones with that? It's relatively cheap because you run only for a few days. You don't need to run for months and, and so on. So my first forecast was three-day forecast of Hurricane Katrina, and this is uh, about at the end of simulation. You see that indeed uh, it looks like Katrina, let me zoom in. Um, and it's actually hit uh, uh, exactly uh, New Orleans in this simulation. So it was very successful in this respect forecast. But it's only three days. Um, so next I turn to Hurricane Irma, which was last year hurricane. Uh, maybe some of you remember that, that hit uh, Florida uh, um, of the United States. And the difficulty with this uh, hurricane uh, forecast that in this case it's about 10 days before it's actually hit, or maybe eight, eight, nine, something like that. But it's a forecast for September 5 for, from various models, uh, various forecasting models. You see that it's all over the place. The actual path is, of course, it was west coast of Florida. It was just brushing it. And only a few models were able to predict that. Uh, one of them was a European Central model. But most other models were completely all over the case, um, all over the place. So it was very challenging forecast. So I tried my model. I initialized on September 5. So and I used 10 ensemble members uh, from European Center. So initial conditions were from European Center. Maybe it's a little bit <laughs> easy. I should have used the NSEP. Uh, so it's not very patriotic, and then it's to everybody knows that initial conditions from European Center are easy. The problem is if you do actual forecast, you won't get them. That's the problem. You can get uh, NSAP, but you cannot get European Center in real time. Uh, so, but I tried like the best. Let's kind of not distract. Like, let's say that it's the best initial conditions that are out there. And what what can we do? And European Center also provides ten member ensemble initial conditions. So very convenient. So I used 10 members. But of course, it's pretty expensive still. 
so I used uh, for for track forecast, I used 17 kilometer model, which is the same model, just degraded by a factor of four, and considerably uh, faster to run it, 50 times faster than real time. So it still can be used like forecasting model, 50 times faster. Um, and then I run one deterministic run forecast for intensity forecast, uh, because you need really high resolution for correct forecasting of intensity of tropical cyclones. And now we here shown some results. So red lines are uh, ensembles, and uh, black line is the actual track, and green one is ensemble mean, which actually puts the projected track on the west coast as, a, as it should. And deterministic forecast, kind of also, but a little bit less accurate, but it's also kind of going to the east coast. The track is not perfect. Uh, it's a little bit north from, uh, from Cuba. Uh, than it should be, um, but overall uh, I, I was very pleased with this. So now uh, I found actually one member out of those. <laughs> that was very good. <laughs> so basically reproduced uh, the observed track. So, but the problem is of course intensi uh, intensity. Um, uh, so here a left figure on the top is showing the intensity, uh, I mean the, the pr uh, central pressure, low, uh, the lo lowest pressure in the center of tropical cyclone, green uh, are, uh, are ensembles, is 10 members, 17 kilometer grid spacing, and that is observed, and uh, uh, the blue line is a four kilometer forecast. So you see that how it's sensitive to resolution. So basically, four kilometer kind of uh, reproduces a, a low pressure. The, the bottom is actually IFS, or European Central Model, which has actually difficulty doing so, uh, even at high resolution, because they, I think because they use hydrostatic model. So high resolution doesn't really help much for them. Uh, and uh, the here on the right is the intensity forecast. So that's again, it's observed. Uh, green ones are... Uh, a 17 kilometer grid, and you see that IFS also has similar 80 kilometer per second intensity, which is largely underestimate the actual intensity um, and uh, or wind speed. Um, and you see that uh, high resolution helps and uh, reproduces the observed intensity. So I'm very optimistic about that. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have much computer time to continue this kind of exercises. I need. So far, I haven't found much interest from uh, from uh, certain agencies. I think it's some some kind of circle of people there, kind of defending themselves. I didn't say that. Okay. Um, so this one is just visualization of that deterministic forecast, just for you to see from the model. So it starts and then it goes. And it starts from very coarse grid. It's like 30 kilometer grid spacing. And it still recurs. So it's going. So now it's maximum intensity. And now it will turn north, very sharp turn. And it brushes on uh, that Florida. OK, it looks pretty realistic, I think. Um, so uh, future plans with, with this model, and of course uh, it's very suitable for extreme weather events. I haven't shown here, I tried high resolution forecast of Long Island weather, and I was successful to predict uh, some line of thunderstorms that was completely underpredicted and it caused considerable flooding on Long Island, and forecast said clear sky, sunlight, sun, sunshine whole day. And, uh, but you need uh, very high resolution for that, and you, then you're able to reproduce it. I haven't shown it, but uh, those who are interested, I could show you later. Um, so, and, and the next thing is, of course, I need the global ocean model with that thing. The funny thing about global ocean model, first of all, dynamical core is the same as atmospheric model, just slightly different buoyancy term because of all. Um, and, uh, and also, there are no clouds. That's so nice. Um, and and also the time step is very large for ocean because you know ocean moving is very slowly and because it's an elastic model there are no sound waves 
so I don't care about those. So ocean model, my projection is it would be uh, 10 times cheaper to run than atmosphere model for the same grid. So it would be basically come for free. Uh, it would take only about maybe 5-10% of computer time. Uh, yeah, and uh, then I could run maybe interaction of hurricanes with, uh, with, with ocean and so on. Okay, that's it. Gracias. Thank you very much, Professor Marat. So this brings back m memories of when I went to talk to Professor Marat and he would talk about some of these things and I didn't understand one word he was saying. Now I understand some, some of it. So I won't trust you if you don't have any questions. No les voy a creer si no tienen preguntas. Y eso que se saltó la parte difícil y técnica. ¿Alguna pregunta? Some questions? Preguntas? Uh, thank you, Martin. It was very. I followed your work for a long time. Thank you, and uh, enjoyed the talk. I had a question. You you mentioned self-organized criticality, and you put it in terms of sea surface temperature. And I think it was work with Emmanuel. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking more the, the kind of traditional, so to speak, in terms of column water vapor, kind of the Neelan, Peters, all that that kind of work. One question: Have you tried to replicate uh, their idea of self critica self-organized criticality in terms of column water vapor with your runs just like do, you, do you get the, the same the plots exactly yeah. do you get their plots we have looked um, other models have looked and we don't see it okay it goes straight the variance like, goes yeah, straight up yes some people believe that it's because of saturation of uh, of a radiometer that would do this right right okay also I was, was going to relate to that all models lack some fundamental physics we, we measured it with uh, GPS precipitable water vapor in the Amazon and what we were doing with, with, with David and, and one of his students, Kathleen Skiro, I don't know if you know her. Um, and what we looked at for land was that you, you have you know, kind of the critical behavior but you don't have the self-organized criticality. You get this continual increase in the variance. It doesn't, you know. Yeah, that's what they so, um, because everything you've done so far, you've done it over the ocean. So the idea would be that there may be some different type of behavior, land versus ocean? Yeah, but I think ocean, one of the things, first of all, ocean is 70% of territory. Um, in tropics, even probably more. But, um, um, and second of all, over the land, I think uh, there, are, um, there is so much noise produced by all this terrain topography on uniform heating that it's more probably an effect of uh, moisture feedback kind of thing. So moist patches create more aggregation. So it's not radiatively driven more. Uh, it's some different mechanism which also operates. Uh, I haven't talked about that, but uh, of course uh, this, that mechanism is also can be important. I, uh Thanks very much. Very nice uh, talk. Um, I was wondering if um, if you were to replace uh, uh, your uh, convective uh, scheme, I mean resolving scheme for clouds um, by with cane fridge type of thing, would you sh would you see the same kind of behavior? I mean, would you go into m <coughs> more aggregation than disaggregation? You mean in w terms of clusters? Yeah. I don't know. Maybe it should be tried, yes. Oh, it's just because it will be interesting to look into the, I mean, what uh, global models using that kind, those kind of things. Yeah, but uh, global models, they have very like maybe 50 kilometer grid spacing, mm -hmm. kind of typical. So, um, yeah, you, you yeah they still, they should look at that. Yes. You, you could run WARF, for instance, with, yeah. with, uh, yeah. with that type of thing for, with, I mean, designing this type of experiments with uh, kind of fridge and, 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 and convective. Yeah, that would be interesting. Yeah, yeah. all right.
Alguien más? Well, I, I have a question. Uh, so at, at the end you talked about uh, hurricanes and first the aggregation of convection and so what role do, do hurricanes play in this uh, view of the tropics and deep convection as a thermostat for this forcing due to CO2 or, or whatever? Well, um, they're of course important. <coughs> That's what people generally care about. Uh, yeah. We have done uh, some study back several years ago with Kerry about this radiative convective equilibrium with rotation where we looked at this response of hurricanes to warming of sea surface temperature. Uh, we didn't see this uh, criticality there, so this kind of switch on off, um, because um, uh, that in that system actually organization is very, uh, very, uh, very influenced by Coriolis, uh, uh, kind of by Rossby radius. And, um, and we saw that in warmer climates, hurricanes become bigger but less frequent. And that's basically many other studies, recent studies. But in terms of effect on climate, except for this kind of brute force effect that hurricanes bring with them, in terms of statistics, I think they're not that important because um, even today, uh, they produce only like about 5% of precipitation in tropics. And in terms of cloud radiative effect, they're very unimportant. Uh, but they may be important for stirring the ocean, the uh, kind of mixing the ocean. I don't know. That's probably why it's, it's very interesting would be to have coupled model like that with hurricanes to see some of those effects. Yeah, maybe they're important. But my first instinct tells me that they're not. I mean, in terms of radiative budget. Sense. Alguien más? Otra, alguna otra pregunta? No? So uh, I have one more question. Then. <laughs> <laughs> so then, thinking about using your model for forecasting, it seems to make sense to talk to other people because you're running these very expensive simulations, but you're keeping your high resolution for. Who knows, maybe you get, while you have a risk of hurricane making landfall in the eastern coast of the US, maybe also India, Bangladesh, some region over there, you have a cyclone and also Japan. So it sounds like something that doesn't make, it, maybe it's too expensive in some cases, but if you get a mo more of a global product with multi-institutions, maybe that makes sense, right? Because you get, all, you resolve all the globe. Yeah, I probably. So far, my attempts to reach uh, that community was not successful because they say that I don't have publications on that subject. Uh -huh. So, well, then publish. probably I will. <laughs> I need to just publish some results, and that, that, <laughs> that will be more inclusive. Okay. Well, ah. ah, there's a question on Facebook. All right. <laughs> Facebook. <laughs> Are hurricanes a, a self-organization response of the atmosphere to the energy increase? Uh, I think I answered a little bit uh, yeah, that yes, uh, yes, they they become more powerful because of that, but they um, become less frequent. And the interesting thing about it that their number in our study we actually show that theoretically and also in a DLA simulation kind of confirming this behavior, number of hurricanes is inversely proportional to um, square root of saturation vapor pressure at, at, at sea surface temperature. And it actually can be shown theoretically. And it, uh, read that paper, it's Karudin of Emmanuel 2013 in uh, James, mm -hmm. if you're interested. Well, it's scaling and also some, uh, not, it's not just scaling, no, it's, uh, it's actually uh, kind of derived. No. Kiri is good in that, yeah. deriving some of those things. <laughs> okay. So no more questions, not even in Facebook? Okay, well, 
Thank you very much, Professor Marat. It was a pleasure having you here.